Hi, if you're watching this video, then you've tuned in to refresh yourself on basic arrhythmia. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see several different segments of different arrhythmias and different classes of arrhythmias. And so today, this is the basic arrhythmia information as far as measuring and all of the, um, all of the initial things that you need to know. So no matter which of the rhythms you're looking at and refreshing your memory on, make sure that you take just a second to watch this video as well, because it's really going to help you understand why the rhythms change the way they do. So I hope you enjoy. We're going to get started and go through some of the basic information. So with basic arrhythmia, remember that the heart muscle is one of the only muscles that can stimulate itself to move. So any other muscle group that we have, my arm, my leg, I have to tell it to move. But the heart muscle does it all by itself. And thank goodness, because obviously we wouldn't be able to remember to tell it to pump. And so when we're looking at basic arrhythmia, we want to know what this shape means and what this does. And so this tells you about the electrical conduction of the heart, but it doesn't really tell you about the mechanical uh, issues of the heart. So in order to think of that, how do you know the heart is really pumping? That's things like pulse and blood pressure. So this is just simply the electrical conduction. Uh, so make sure you take that into mind. A lot of times when you get into nursing and you get into the medical field, we get so focused on all of the lights and the blinkers and the alarms, but you want to remember that you always want to be looking at the patient. This is just one piece of the puzzle. So make sure that you keep that in mind as well. Um, also, we want to think about um, why the muscle is moving. So this is that fabulous sodium potassium pump that you guys probably had somewhere way back in your pathophysiology. And I'm just going to very briefly cover it. And if you think about it, where does sodium live and where does potassium live? Potassium lives in the cells, sodium lives outside of the cells. And this is what causes the muscle to contract. So when the sodium rushes into the cell, the potassium rushes out and it causes muscle contraction. And so that's what we have to have in the heart situation because we want the heart to be able to pump. So that's all we're going to cover on that. But just keep in mind that um, the reason I like to go over that is when you look at a patient's uh, labs, the reason why they're so important is we have this very basic mechanism that if we don't have the right uh, bath of electrolytes in the body, then we're not going to have the muscles pump the way they should. So keep that in mind um, because sometimes you can be a scientist and figure out what's going on just simply by knowing the basics of the muscle contraction. So when we look at the electrical pathway of the heart, I like to keep it really, really simple. Um, and so if you think about the heart itself, obviously we have the atrium and we have the ventricle. But we also have an electrical pathway. And I like to teach basic arrhythmia based on the electrical pathway because I think it makes more sense that way. So let's go over what it is. OK, so your starting point in any of them, of course, is the SA node. So the SA node, or the sinoatrial node, lives in the atrium. And this is always the starting point. This should be the starting point of every time the heart pumps. If the heart is not pumping correctly and the SA node is not driving the conduction, then you'll start to see problems with your tracings on your EKG sheet. And so it gives us hints of what's going on in the electrical pathway. So the starting point is the SA node. From there, we have these intraatrial pathways. And I bet you probably can't see that real well, but intraatrial pathways, they wrap around the atrium. And the, um, when we have the electrical conduction in the SA node, then it wraps around and it forces that muscle to pump. So that's the idea of this. When the SA node shoots electrical current this way, it also will shoot 
down, not just up. And the reason it wants to do that is there's a second node down here. So this little guy in between is called the internodal pathway. It's like an interstate, you know, a, a road between two states, internodal pathway, a road between two nodes. That's like a, like a soap opera, <laughs> the, the road between two nodes. So this is your AV node, okay? And this has a completely different shape when you're looking at your EKG tracings. So when you have electrical conduction that's starting in the AV node instead of the SA node, you're going to be able to see that in just the tracings on the EKG paper. So this is your next part. This little guy is a big, thick piece called your bundle of hiss. Okay, so this is going to get you to your bundle branches. And the bundle branches are basically just like these guys up here, except the electrical pathway wraps around the ventricle. And so when the electrical conduction comes down, it wraps around the ventricle and forces it to pump. And so that's kind of the idea. And then you have these little itsy bitsy things that are embedded in the ventricle called Purkinje fibers. And those are the final piece of the puzzle for the electrical conduction. So this is definitely your starting point. This is something that really should be um, something that you try to memorize or at least have a good grasp of because as you have this in mind, it'll become much, much easier to figure out why you're seeing different tracings, why you're seeing um, uh, different little blips, different little bumps, changes of direction, if you just remember the electrical conduction pathway. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, we also have inherent rates. So when we look at the heart rates, you should have an average heart rate of what? You should have 60 to 100. And so our normal inherent rate okay, is 60 to 100. And that is beats per minute. Okay, so this is telling you it's beats per minute of how many times the heart uh, beats through a cycle. Now, the SA node, this is the inherent rate of the SA node. So right away, when we see a heart rate in this uh, range of 60 to 100, it's one piece of the puzzle to tell us that it's probably coming from the SA node because of the range of the rate of the heart rate itself. Now, the inherent rate of the AV node is 40 to 60 beats per minute. So when you have the AV node as the driving factor, and that's the one starting the electrical conduction pathway, the AV node fires at a slower rate. And so when I have a heart rate of, say, 45, just right there, that's a piece of the puzzle that may make me go, Huh, I wonder if I have a problem with my starting point. Maybe I have the AV node as my starting point. And then the ventricle itself, has a inherent rate too. So the ventricle is really smart. It's a muscle that knows it has to pump. And if it does not get any electrical stimulation, Sometimes it will actually try to pump itself. And if it does so, then we're going to have rates somewhere between 20 to 40. Now, if you're thinking about a muscle and you're thinking about the purpose of what the heart's supposed to do, the heart is basically supposed to push the blood around. But really, when you break it down, the purpose of the heart is to push the blood around and what's in the blood? Oxygen. So the whole purpose of the heart is to push around oxygen to the muscles and the muscles need the oxygen and then they use the oxygen and then they put the carbon dioxide back into the bloodstream and then we get rid of it. So that's the whole purpose is the transportation of oxygen around the body and that is the whole idea. But when we have a rate of say 25, is that going to keep the body alive? It's not going to necessarily keep the body alive, but it may buy you some time. And so that's really the whole purpose of this having a slow rate is that sometimes it will buy you some time to get to where you can get to help. 
And so the body's just very smart in that and the heart muscle itself. And so definitely remember your inherent rates because it's a good way to figure out what might be causing problems. Now, when we look at um, measuring, now measuring is a big deal, of course, because it tells us a lot. The measuring on the paper Okay, so all we're doing when we're measuring the EKG rhythm is that we are looking at strength and we're looking at time. So strength is in milliamps, time is in milliseconds. So all this is doing is telling me how long the uh, conduction pathway is taking to get through all of the parts of the heart and get to the next heartbeat. And so it's really important that you have a good grasp of how to measure correctly, because if you don't, you really can be missing uh, a lot of problems with the patient. So really, really important to be able to do that. So with this one, you have uh, small boxes and you have big boxes. Okay, and you'll have thicker lines and that's how you know. So each of the small boxes is 0.04 milliseconds, and each of the big boxes is 0 0.20 milliseconds. So if you think about it, you need five big boxes to get one second, okay? So um, when we start looking at rates, I'm gonna show you a really easy way to figure out the heart rate without needing a computer something that is very, very quick. So remember to do your measurements correctly. Um, and we're actually going to show you on the floor, we're gonna have some handouts coming around to make sure you know how to, where to start your measurement and where to stop your measurement. So make sure that you know where they are supposed to start and stop because you can get things wrong when you're not sure on that very basic situation, okay? Um, all right, so now let's talk about when we start to have trouble with rhythms, let me erase this real quick. Okay, so when we have uh, an EKG strip and it's got all these different lines and we start to see that we're having some dysrhythmias, we're seeing ectopy, we're seeing something not right. Um, the main thing that we want to do is investigate what could be the cause. So if we're having problems and why we're having arrhythmias, um, there's lots of things that can be causing it. Oops, got it. <laughs> That's a hard one to spell. H-Y-T-H-M-I-A-S. All right, so why arrhythmia? So there are um, six things that can really affect so when you see that your patient is having ectopy, make sure you check out these six things, okay? The first thing is temperature. If your patient's core body temperature is too high, meaning they have a fever, or too low, let's say they came from surgery and they cooled them down, they can start to have ectopy, okay? So body temperature, number one, make sure that that's in the right range. Number two, you can have trouble with fluid status. So fluid status meaning if I'm dehydrated, I can have trouble with arrhythmias. If I'm overloaded and I'm in CHF, I can have trouble with uh, arrhythmias, okay? So fluid status can be the problem. O2 status. If you have somebody that has underlying respiratory problems or uh, pneumonia, and they're not getting enough oxygen into the lung space, then when we are pushing the oxygen around, we don't have a good starting point. And so we can start to see problems with oxygen levels creating arrhythmias. We can have structural damage. So if somebody has had an MI, and they've had problems and they've had a heart attack um, and there's something blocking it, they have a bundle branch block or there's something, um, they have a clot, 
um, they themselves, just structurally, they can be causing arrhythmias if there's structural damage, okay? Also, if we have stress or pain. And if you think about pretty much 75% of our patients, maybe even higher than that, that are in the hospital, who is not stressed and or in pain? So this one can be a big one. So just the fact that they're having stress or that they're having pain can start to cause arrhythmias. So make sure that you're paying close attention to that. Drugs, there's actually seven, I missed one. Drugs, and this can be drugs we give them or this can be drugs that they've taken on their own like recreational drugs. So a lot of times they can have problems with arrhythmias based on drug levels in their body. Um, even patients that are on prescription medication, let's say we have a little old lady who's in her 80s and she took too much of her digoxin. We're gonna start to see problems and arrhythmias because the drug levels are off in her body, okay? And then the last one and the most common one, the one that we pretty much checked first, is electrolytes balance. And that's because of that sodium potassium pump. And the three things, actually there's four, but the most common things causing that is potassium and magnesium, and also your calcium and your sodium can cause problems with arrhythmias. So these are the seven things that can really cause arrhythmias. If your patient starts to have ectopy or starts to have trouble, make sure you're going through this list to try to figure out what the problem is. So it kind of gives you a good starting point to figure out what the problem is. Also, if you think about it from a um, nervous system situation, when we think about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, and that's, I'm not going any further than that, I'm not gonna lose you, but if you think about that, sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight. And so that's the one where we're poking patients or they're having pain, um, that fight or flight, it's gonna make their heart rate go up. It's gonna um, make their stress level go up. We can start to see some arrhythmias. Um, versus the opposite, the parasympathetic nervous system. We can actually have problems with that where patients are um, causing problems with their parasympathetic nervous system and then we're getting heart rates that are dropping. We're getting blood pressures that are dropping. And so um, a lot of times we actually are encouraging this parasympathetic nervous system. Um, if you take ACLS, one of the things that we try to do is to vagal them. And so that is basically activating the parasympathetic nervous system to try to get a tachycardia down where it should be, okay? And so reminder on those, you can have them cough, you can have, you can put cold water on the back of their neck, different things that you can do that are basic interventions um, without medications that can help with some of the problems they may be having. Okay, so that's all the basic information, um, except for the waves themselves. So if you think of the waves, just want to remind you what letters they are. So we have our P wave, our Q, R, S, and our T wave. And so the P wave is the atrium stimulation. So if you're needing to look at what's going on with the atrium, you need to look at the P wave, okay? And you should have a nice rounded P wave. It shouldn't be pointy, it shouldn't be double notched, it shouldn't be inverted, it should be nice and rounded, and that's gonna mean that it's coming from the SA node, actually. But if you're looking for what's going on in the atrium, you wanna look at the P wave. If you're looking at what's going on in the ventricle, you wanna look at the QRS. And if you look at um, your sodium potassium pump, you have depolarization, and you have repolarization. So when the sodium rushes into the cell, that's depolarization, meaning that the muscle is gonna contract. And then when it gets to the resting cycle, to go back to the resting cycle, it's called repolarization. Well, the heart has to do that too. And so when it has electrical stimulation and depolarizes, that is the P wave, okay? The QRS is the ventricle 
depolarization or the starting point of that to be able to contract. The T wave is actually the ventricle repolarization, going back to its resting state. Okay? But we're missing the atrial repolarization. We're actually not. It's just buried somewhere in this QRS. It's just that the wave is smaller than the QRS, so it hides it. Okay, so it would be a little tiny thing down here. Now, if the P wave is the atrial depolarization and the QRS is the ventricle depolarization, why is it so much higher? Remember, if we're looking at these little waves, all it is is strength. So how high the line goes means that it contracted stronger. The electrical contraction was stronger. And so the reason being that the atrium is much smaller, a much smaller muscle than the ventricle. It takes more stimulation to move the ventricle than it does the atrium. Remember the atrium, all it has to do is dump from the atrium to the ventricle. But the ventricle has to push the blood all the way out around the body or all the way through the lungs, wherever it's going. And so the muscle has to be much, much stronger um, and much heavier and therefore it takes more to move it. So this will become important as far as repolarization and depolarization, okay? And that is pretty much it, with the exception of your normal values. Your PRI should be 12 to 20 milliseconds. And your PRI is the beginning of the P wave up to the Q wave. So it's the time that it takes for the atrium to talk to the ventricle. That's what you're measuring when you're looking at the PRI uh, segment, okay? So 0.12 to 0.20, that's three little boxes to five little boxes or one big box. The QRS, it varies depending on which book you look at. But I want you to remember it as up to 0.12. That's a pretty basic measurement there. And the QRS is the entire contraction through the ventricle, the depolarization of the ventricle. And the last wave that's measured, it tells us more about the heart, but it doesn't tell us what rhythm they're in. It just tells us a little bit more about the heart. The QT is the beginning of the Q wave all the way to the end of the T. And this is the entire process through the ventricle. So the depolarization all the way through the repolarization and it's ready now to have an electrical stimulation again. Again, this measurement depends on what book you look at. We're gonna remember it as 0, 0.40. So those are your normal measurements. And then that's it for your basic information. If you're interested in refreshing yourself, Go ahead and look for the next video that talks about sinus rhythms. Okay, thanks.